And welcome to episode four of Cathonica, which is the uh, show all about horror fiction in all its frightening forms. And today I have with me uh, a man who I'm sure is, is no stranger to uh, folks who are listening to this podcast. That's Paul Tremblay, who is the author of a number of um, best-selling works, well-known uh, stories. Um, um, of course, we've got a, a, you know, a head full of ghosts, uh, recently Survivor's Song, um, and, uh, and the short story collection Growing Things, which I really loved as well. Um, so, uh, Paul, great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Sure. Thank you for having me here. You know, happy to talk about you know, stories that, that are cool. So Absolutely. Uh, thanks. Well, Absolutely. Now, of course, my, my first question is, how do we pronounce your name? Is it Paul, Trim <laughs> Paul Trimblay, Paul Tremblay, or Paul Tremblay? Um, it's fine. I, it might sound weird to say, like, I'm not picky. I mean, up here, like I say up here, like in New England, that usually, you know, the kids call me Mr. Tremblay. Yes, uh, yes. Or Mr. Tremblay. Uh, you know, if we were, you know, speaking with a French Canadian accent, as is, you know, that's the Tremblay side, it would be Tremblay. Oh, but, wow. You know, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Paul Gaetan Tremblay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, for, for the French, for the French side. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's awesome. Cool, cool. Well, um, so, so uh, I'm doing this little series. Uh, I'll, I'll call it hor your origin story, I guess. You know what? What? Uh, what is? Um, you know, tell me about a couple of stories that that you encountered that have helped um, that either really impressed you, you know, left a mark on you, or I think in your case especially, uh, you know, helped kind of uh, point you in the direction of being a horror writer and uh, mm -hmm. asked you to choose a couple of stories. And and so uh, you chose one that you've spoken about on a number of, of interviews, which is uh, the Joyce Carol Oates story, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Of course, we, you know, probably a lot of people are familiar with it because it's one mm -hmm. of these most anthologized stories, especially for a living writer. Um, this is one of those stories you're going to probably encounter in college, in, in your college lit class. Um, and the other story is The Dirty Kid by Mariana, uh, Mariana Enriquez. Hope I'm saying that right. And that's very recent. It's 2017 from her collection mm -hmm. of things we lost in the fire. Uh, and the Joyce Carol Oates is a, it was uh, first written in 1966 or first published in 1966. So wow. a couple of stories that are both, um, you know, kind of earlier in, in, in horror literature and, and very recent horror literature, but also two stories that are very different points in your life as a writer. So I'm, I'm really right. excited to talk about these. <laughs> So first, um, let me give us a, a quick recap and, and you know, everyone, hey, spoilers, this is spoilerific, this is spoiler fest time. Uh, we're going to go yeah. into a lot of detail talking about it. If you have uh, not read these stories, you might want to put us on pause for a minute. You can get both of these stories online. You can get them both for free online. That's right. Um, you can go to Joyce Carol Oates's website, which is uh, Celestial timepiece.com uh, and you can just look for the story where are you going where have you been Joyce Carol Oates Google that you'll find it and then Dirty Kid is free at electricliterature.com again Google that you'll find uh, the full text of both stories go read them They're, they are short stories they're pretty quick read um, and now let me give you a recap uh, so we just remember what the story is all about so from Joyce Carol Oates her story where are you going where have you been Connie is a pretty 15-year-old in mid-century middle America. She lives with her disinterested father and her derisive mother, who is always comparing Connie to her plain, predictable, responsible sister, June. Connie is at that teenage inflection point of moving from innocence to sophistication, going to town with her girlfriends and getting involved with boys, all the while thinking she's pulled the wool over the eyes of her parents. Connie's house in summertime is pure tedium, and it's diametric opposite as the burger joint downtown, thick with the hormone-infused vigor of adolescence, kept in rhythm by the pop music of the day. As Connie enjoys the scene with her girlfriends and her young suitors, she sees that a shaggy-haired boy sitting in a gold-painted jalopy is watching her. One hot Sunday afternoon while her family is away, amidst the daydreams of love and the succulence of sexual awakening, the gaudy gold jalopy pulls up to her house. The driver's name, Arnold Friend, is emblazoned in black tar-like letters on the side of his car. In the passenger seat is a chubby boy Arnold calls Ellie, who barely speaks. Arnold, a grinning, greasy shyster of a man, says he's come to take her for a ride, asks her to come out from behind her screen door and step into his car. The brief exhilaration of having a mysterious suitor quickly gives way to concern for her own safety. Arnold Friend knows Connie's name, her friend's names. He says he knows everybody. 
taking a closer look, she realizes Arnold Friend is not a teenager. He's much older, maybe 30. And his speechless companion, Ellie, is a man-child of at least 40. Arnold Friend supplicates her with a huckster's desperation to join him for a ride. She says her dad will be home soon. Arnold tells her exactly where her parents and sister are, what they're doing right that moment, and seems to go into and back out of a clairvoyant trance as Connie begins to grow dazed, falling under a spell. When he makes it clear his intention is to become her lover, she gets spooked and steps back inside, putting the screen door between them. As Migra defenses this is, Arnold seems unable to enter her house. He even has difficulty stepping away from his car without losing his balance. When he threatens her family, Connie goes to call the police in her growing befuddlement. She picks up the phone and without dialing, screams into it for her mom before collapsing. She regains consciousness and Arnold Friend cajoles her off the floor and through the screen door toward her, his waiting arms. Her house now seems alien to her and she follows his commands as though there were now no other option available. So very, very creepy, creepy story. Uh, now, Paul, before you read this story, at least what, mm -hmm. what I've heard on, on, on other interviews you've given, you are already reading horror. You, you've noted publicly your reaction to Stephen King's It as an 18 year old. <laughs> what, what did you do with the book? Didn't you like throw oh, it across yeah. the I just room threw it across the room. I was, yeah. yeah, I was recovering from major like back surgery. So yeah, yes, I probably yeah. wasn't a very strong throw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh. <laughs> But but yeah, so this wasn't you're you're already reading horror to some degree, but you have described this uh, reading Joyce Carol Oates' story as being something like a watershed moment in your journey to becoming a writer. What was it about this story and and maybe in part the time in which you read it that had such a big impact on you? Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny, like I actually really wasn't reading a lot of horror at that point. Uh, like, you know, the point you mentioned when I was 18, you know, after I'd had severe uh you know, spinal fusion or not, I don't know if that's the right word. Yeah. But after I had major, 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 major yeah. would be better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, ah, you know, I'm stuck in the house. I just can't watch TV the whole time. I figured I would try to read and it didn't go well when I tried to read it. So <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I was a math major in college, Providence yeah. College. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, like I read the books that were assigned to me, but like I was, I certainly was not a reader for pleasure. Yeah. I was a child of 80s cable television oh, yes. <laughs> and sitcom reruns, MASH, uh, Barney Miller. This is what, you know, that's what I did. Oh, wow. Afternoons. <laughs> yes. So th it, long, boring story. I'll, I'll just cut to like sort of the, the chase is I ended up instead of math education through various screw ups, I ended up math humanities. So I had to fulfill one last humanities requirement in my last semester. And I basically took like a freshman English class, like a lit one-on-one kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I, you know, and this was one of the stories, you know, that was assigned to us by our teacher and the, our professor, Dr. McLaughlin, um, was into punk music. So I really sort of connected to that. I know his favorite band was like the Dead Boys. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, as like a good teacher does, like, you know, he saw his in with me. It was through, you know, sort of music and stuff like that. So I'll never forget two of the stories I read. One of them was Greasy Lake by T.C. Boyle. And um, and this story, where are you going? Where have you been? Like, the, the paper I wrote. <laughs> um Comparing, you know, the, the threat of violence in both of those stories. And I think I, I tried to weave in Jane's Addiction's Ted Just Admit It, the song. I don't know oh, if you're wow. aware of that song. I, I don't know that song, um, but I know Jane's Addiction. Also yeah, yeah. a kid of the, of the pop music in the 80s, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but what, this story in particular, I remember reading it and it was just like, I don't know, for me, it was a light bulb moment. I was like, oh, you know, I didn't know people wrote things like this. I mean, yes. I remember thinking that vividly. Um, and I, you know, I was just excited by the story, like what it, sort of what it did to me and how it felt, uh, you know, sort of the danger it presented. And, you know, shortly after that, that was, you know, spring of, geez, spring of 93. And then later that summer when I turned, for my birthday, my girlfriend bought me Stephen King's The Stand. And, you know, in combination with the Joyce Carol Oates story in that English class that I took, you know, that sparked a love of reading, which a couple of years later became, oh, maybe I'll try writing a story. But yeah, no, for me, this was like... <laughs> story zero or ground zero I wow mean, really wow you know i if you had told me like in january or december of 92 january of 93 that hey you know someday you're gonna become a writer never mind like someone who reads a lot i would have been like you're crazy like you know i was <laughs> thinking you know 
math, et cetera. Used to make fun of English majors. Oh yeah. <laughs> including, yes. including my wife. Yes. Nice. Yeah. No, so the story <laughs> definitely was like, you know, changed, changed everything for me. There's um, I've noticed in this story and, and also I think in, uh, in the dirty kid, but uh, especially in the James uh, Joyce Carol Oates story, there's, um, so much of, a, of a just internal psychological realism that I think does resonate with a lot of your work. Um, I, lo I love the little detail, for example, where, um, it, you know, you see so much of this, of course, from it's all really from Connie's perspective, but it says mm -hmm. her, her, you know, talks about her mother, just always dogging her. She's just always kind of belittling her and she's right. got such a bad, divisive and derisive relationship. But, it, but it, uh, she writes, her mother had been pretty once too. Connie's a, a very pretty girl. Her mother had been pretty once too, if you could believe those old snapshots in the album. But now her looks were gone. And that was why she was always after Connie. This kind of, uh, yeah, bickering relationship with her mom. And she, you know, it's not the only thing she says about the relationship, but boy, that sure seems to sum it up. But you, yeah, you really, it's not just about a, you know, a, an isolated threat that is happening to a person. Now that this is, this is a girl who is in a specific place and time and you really get a sense of that. Um, so yeah, I guess th that internal realism, psychological realism is very powerful in the story. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, so, you know, there, there, you know, there's that part of it. I think what I was, you know, especially reading it now, I'm definitely drawn to, um, I think when I initially first read it though, it was like, geez, I wasn't really sure, you know, what was real, what was happening yes. despite it being so realistic. And, uh, you know, as a math person, <laughs> especially at the time, <laughs> I don't know, it seemed to me like she, even in the descriptions, it was always like an either, or, it was almost like it was, you know, binary code, like zero, like a, like a program written in zero and ones, but yes. all the zeros and ones were all these different choices you had to make as the reader when, when Joyce wow. Carol was sometimes giving you like one choice or another, or sometimes comparing something to the short past or to the present, or, you know, just even like Arnold friend's appearance, like he looks young, but maybe he's old, like, you know, maybe this he's short, maybe there's something stuffed in his boots. Maybe, you know, there's not like, you know, even the description of Ellie as like an old baby, Yes. Um, yeah. You know, there's all these like weird little moments where you, as a reader, you kind of you're forced to pick one way or the other. And, and where you choose in that story sort of leads you further down into other sets of choices. You know, all those like zero and ones. That's a really interesting observation, because I was as I was reading back through it this afternoon, I'm, I'm thinking like some weird, weird stuff happens. Arnold Friend, at least as far as we can tell, as far as Connie can tell, he is able to say exactly where. Um, her mom and dad and, and sister are. They're at this barbecue at someone mm -hmm. else's house. He mentions an, like a, a fat old lady or something who's there. And Connie's like, wait, he's talking about Mrs. So-and-so. Like this guy could just be a con artist. He could right. have just gone and met a bunch of people and he could be, yeah, he's just a con artist maybe. And a, and a, and a you know, serial rapist, serial killer, a bad guy. I mean, he seems like a manipulative bad guy, but he's doing so, the effect he has on her is such that you know you, you look at this and say man this, is this like the devil is this some kind of supernatural entity right. like he can't come into her house why well he he says he can't come into her house or he won't come into her house unless she calls the police but there's right. a sense that he can't even get out of his car without lo potentially losing his balance well i mean it's possible he's just like a sickly dude who's having a hard time standing up. So he wants to stay in his car, but there's like these elements around it that just seem so supernatural. So, I mean, what, what do you think? Is it possible that he is only just human based on what we're reading in the story? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly possible. I mean, cause as you mentioned, it is through Connie's point of view, although it is somewhat filtered, you know, I do think, you know, an omniscience in, in some cases sort of, you know, gets in there sometimes, mm -hmm. but uh, there's just, just, you know, especially once, you know, the story opens almost like this nostalgic American graffiti kind of scenario. Yes, yes. Bro, coming of age, 15-year-old, you know. In the 1950s sort of in, or 60s, yeah, it's, it's that overly, perfect, like, you know, Overly era. protected by your parents, by your yeah. mom in particular, you know, to see a boy. And then the boy shows up at the house. But, <laughs> you know, but what shows up at their house is not, <laughs> you know, is no longer American graffiti, obviously. Yes. Um, and just how quickly it goes awry. Um, and it's hard to pinpack up. Uh, pinpoint exactly the point where it does go awry because i mean i think there's subtle shades of of menace that creeps up to the point where you know until you know obviously we get to the point where he's telling her that like if she calls her parents like, 
you know, or if he calls the police, you know, he'll kill her family and stuff like yeah. that. So obviously, you know, lines cross, but as you mentioned, like he still, he tells her I'm not coming in the house. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And then I was always weirded out by the description of his feet. Um, yes. Yeah. Like, you know, is his cowboy boot stuffed or like, there's even a little hint is like, as though, like his feet might be hooves, but it's yes, not totally yes. clear. Yeah. Like they, they, they go part way down into the boots, but not all the way down. Like maybe there's something stuffed down there. And I'm mm. sitting here thinking, okay, well, I mean, what would that be? That would be like his, his feet aren't doing this, like doing right. that. Oh no. Hold on a second. Uh, maybe yeah. it's the hoof there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's completely creepy. Um, even like, I love the detail of, um, uh, what's written on his car so he has yeah. this car he's painted he seems to be very proud of his car even though the radio is broken and ellie's got this transistor radio that he's kind of zoomed at kind of zoned out on um but you've got this car that has like his name written on it in black tar like letters um it's got other things written on it like some some numbers he says are a secret code that's like the numbers 33 19 and 17 right um I, do you know what to make of that does that mean do you have you ever heard that that means anything um <laughs> I, 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 well, I so much theory. of it i think apparently is like you know there's a lot of biblical reference in the story so i don't know yeah. if that you know if those numbers relate to anything in the bible or not uh, yeah. two of the three are my favorite numbers so i don't know what it means beyond that <laughs> maybe it was written for you before. Yeah, absolutely for me. Yeah, before before you were born, um, it, uh, there's some, I think there's one theory that says those are the ages of previous victims. But yeah, who mm -hmm. knows? That's the shot in the dark. There's probably some biblical allusion there. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But mm -hmm. um, uh, but on the front it says um, "Man the Flying Saucers," which apparently right. is like some joke or slogan or something that was that was popular the year before she notes like there was probably a science fiction movie that everyone you know or some government program where they're like oh we're going to be sending people to the moon man the flying saucers something like that but it's like um arnold friend is um really trying to keep up with the latest to make sure right. everyone knows he's like a teenager talk their language use their jargon but he's, he's kind of behind on the times and she's very she's keenly aware of that um and the the description of his um uh, but but that he's that he's got that written like on his front fender or something right like oh here comes the here comes one of us uh, yeah he's he's talking about manning the flying saucers it's so like devious and awkward at the same time it's a it's a weird mix and i, I love the fact that also she describes um his hair as being like this black shaggy mess that it almost looks like a wig and like i'm thinking yeah probably right. probably is a wig there um, I think it even notes that his face looks tanned, but then like his from the neck, his neck is pale, like he didn't get all the makeup on or something when he was <laughs> trying to make himself up. So very strange. He, yeah, he just seems like this, this devil figure. And now that you bring it up, it's like, well, no, I mean, it could just be a con artist, a kind of a real, real creepy one. But I guess mm -hmm. you, it is left to you to kind of, you know, you can step back and you have this pointillistic kind of picture. It's all these uh, dots here right. on the screen. Well, I mean, I think part of the magic of the story is, you know, so when you read it and then when you think about it later, I think, you know, in the moments you're more, I mean, I'm certainly more open to supernatural sort of interpretations. And then like, you know, if years go by and I haven't read it in my memory is like, Oh, it's a lot more ambiguous. Like maybe he was just a con artist. Yeah. You know, and then if you go back to read it again, sort of with this foreknowledge, you know, the things that jump off the page, like even, you know, the, the man, the flying saucers line, it, it's, you know, it's such a strange line, like yes. as you said, to, to have put on your car, you know, and there's something even menacing about it. It's like, what does that mean, man, the flying saucers? It, like, to me, I mean, it puts into your mind, like, well, you know, they're aliens, like, are we gonna, you know, there's some sort of like, almost like attack sort of weird vibe to it. It's like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I imagine like, you Mars know, flying women. Used to, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, you know, shortly after that, like, on the next page, she, you know, she describes Ellie. And to me, Ellie is the, the, the character that sort of pushes me over into, okay, there's something really strange happening yes, here. Yes, yes. Um, you know, that he doesn't say anything, he's just sitting there. Um, you know, the face of a 40-year-old baby is such a cool descriptive line, oh, yeah. and so... Yeah unsettling as well yes yes and that he yeah he doesn't say anything until finally after she's she's threatened to call the police um then ellie's like you want me to pull the phone out and i'm of course i'm thinking in my head immediately i was going to pull out his cell phone wait no they don't have cell phone 
oh, he's talking about going inside and pulling like the phone line out of right, the wall right. or something. Um, so he's just like, seems to be some kind of thug in a like entranced thug. Like has he been riding around in this car for maybe two straight years or something with with this guy and can't move, can't get out. And he's just, he just sounds like a, like a drone of some sort, a zombie of some sort. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that was a, that's a creepy, creepy character. Um, the, uh, what do you make of the title? Um, where are you going? Where have you been? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the title. Like, I don't know, because to me, it's just like, if I think of the title, I just think of the story. Yeah. Um, but, right, I mean, I guess it's, I mean, I think the questions are for Connie, right? You know, where, where is she going? Ultimately, yeah. we don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah you know and the where have you been it, you know speaks of menace to me like i mean i think that's the implication that you know something happens to her after she goes yeah yeah um, you know because the, the story ends with her getting into the car yeah yeah obviously she's heading his um, she's heading into his car in this and, and, you know in, in this trance now uh, let me say I'll, I'll come back to the kind of state that she's in in a second when i hear that title where are you going where have you been what does come to mind is the book of Job. In the first chapter, there's this scene, you get a quick little mm. shot of Job, this good, righteous man who truly fears God. He even makes sacrifices for his children in case his children have done something that they're not bad, that, they're, that they haven't confessed, they're not aware of. Um, and then, then you go up to heaven and here's God and his angels are walking around and stuff, the sons of God or whatever walking around. Um, and uh, uh, you know, starting in verse six, it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. That idea of going back, you know, mm. where are you going? Where have you been? Is kind of God's question to, to and who's he asking that to? To the devil. Uh, so yeah. I, that's the that's the closest thing I can find. But it it's not it's not quite the same language. But boy, it sure right. puts to to mind that question. And and, and while the Satan in the especially in the in the First Testament uh, text is really considered the accuser. By the time you get to the New Testament, he's really the tempter. Um, and you've got Arnold Friend here tempting Connie to kind of follow her natural instincts and do something which is, well, dang clearly dangerous. I mean, it doesn't take long before he's a menacing figure, but there right. is a moment in there when he first shows up, like someone pulls up in the car, wait, that's not my dad's car. Oh my gosh, someone's here. And she runs, she, she doesn't go run out on the front porch to see who it is. She runs and checks in the mirror um, and sees, does she, how does she look? There's somebody here. And then she sees, you know, hey, it's a man. She doesn't quite see who it is at first, but there's a man. Like, does she look okay? Is she put together? And then she sees it, that, that weird guy from the restaurant the night before. Um, and there's a moment, I think, of real tantalization for her where she's like excited. Some guy has come to see her and her parents don't know about it. And right. he's uninvited and it quickly turns into fear. But she is kind of in the state of, uh, I guess, this um, emergence of her, um, you know, kind of going through adolescence and, and her emergence into, um, you know, heading toward adulthood uh, has put her in a state where maybe she's more, well, I think it's kind of her, her emergence into a more sophisticated um, age has actually made her more vulnerable in this mm -hmm. case. If she were just a small child, she'd probably run and hide somewhere in the house. If she were an adult woman, she'd maybe get the shotgun or would definitely call the police, but she's in this really vulnerable state here um uh, just because of her her age so yeah it does seem to make her more vulnerable and she she goes like it I, I guess i could see it being possible that because of her kind of awakening and it's pretty clear that she's been kind of like messing around with boys and stuff at the mm -hmm. restaurant she'll like go on the drive with eddie or whatever in her his car and come back three hours later well what have, what have, you know what have they been doing all that time so um maybe uh, maybe she's just at a point psychologically emotionally where um she would be really fall prey to a guy who's telling her to do something that she knows is just flat out dangerous sure no, I, I, absolutely. But also the way I think Oates writes it, you know, even though, like, as you mentioned, you know, there's hints that, you know, maybe she did, you know, <laughs> you know, some necking or whatever, you yeah. know, to use the parlance of the day. Yes, the yes. I mean, I, it, it, 
that initial beginning maybe just reads to me in that sort of nostalgic glow uh, of somewhat innocence of you know of innocently sort of approaching like the line of adulthood in some way yeah um and like even when the car first pulls up i i don't think as a reader you feel any sort of sense of threat or menace um not until a you know a gold car shows up <laughs> yeah you know and then arnold's you know starts talking you know and then it you know just slows like oh this isn't right you know you can even even like how am i gonna you can feel connie you know at first excited but like how am i gonna extricate myself from this but still sort of trying to play along she doesn't want to seem uncool um you know so that teen you know the teenager sort of feeling like well you know my gut's telling me that this is wrong but yeah also like i don't <laughs> but maybe i'm wrong right yeah. um i mean there's that definitely that in the beginning until it's clearly over the line you yeah. know arnold is wrong and she still doesn't know not that i would know what to do <laughs> Uh, how to get out of it. I mean, what, how he presents with her, you know, what's going to happen to her family, you know, if she doesn't comply. Yeah. Obviously it doesn't seem to leave her with much choice. Yeah. And he says, if he, as long as she doesn't, you know, pick up the phone and call the cops, then he's not going to come inside. Well, she does pick up the phone. He still doesn't come inside, but he's, he's weaving. I mean, it just seems to me like he's weaving a spell over her. And yet, I mean, man, because she's very, she seems very confused. Uh, It doesn't take long before she starts struggling to think clearly well but right. but isn't that completely plausible for, by uh, on completely naturalistic terms that in this situation a con man or maybe maybe not even just a skilled con man but somebody could talk a young girl into well, doing sure something i very, mean you know that she knows is pretty dangerous if this was written today i think you know someone would describe it as like here's an older man you know grooming a younger grooming. girl right yeah that's the word we um, use for it now yes yes yeah I, I think yeah. a lot of the magnificence of the story is just the the gradual measured pace with which Oates reveals the the monstrous and and possibly unearthly nature of of Arnold Friend. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, just like his you know the the skin on his face doesn't quite look right. The sure. his hair looks like a you know <laughs> is it a wig? What's the deal with this guy Ellie in the car? Um, and his even yeah. Arnold's uh, Arnold's name itself is just a letter or two away from an old fiend. Oh yeah, um, that's right. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes. So yeah, completely creepy. Um, I, I do think there's um, it's interesting to you know the the kind of the resonance or uh, yeah, the resonance with some of Flannery O'Connor's work. Um, she has a short story called Temple uh, a Temple of the Holy Ghost where you get a couple of girls. Um, and they go to like convent school, you know, during like a kind of a vacation Bible school kind of scenario. <laughs> um, and they're, you know, they're, they're also teenage girls and they're growing up and, and the nuns are maybe a, a bit of a figure of, you know, ridicule or something to them. But, um, but you, you definitely get a sense of them transitioning into young women there uh, with also a, a very strange ending. But the but mix in a very strong shot of a good man is hard to find um, mm-hmm. in the, in the uh, except instead of the, um, what's, what's the name of the, uh, the bad guy, the misfit, instead of the misfit, it's Arnold yeah. Fiend. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Yeah. It does, it does have a, a bit of a sense of the kind of Flannery O'Connor type work as well. Well, um, um, I, I did ask you if you had like a favorite passage from this that, that you wouldn't mind reading just to give sure. us a taste of, uh, of what appealed to you so much when you first read this. You know, there's so many to choose from. Like I had marked like an earlier paragraph where sort of Arnold introduces himself. And I had the man, the flying saucers paragraph. Yes. But I'm going to read one where I think this paragraph is where sort of she knows, um, you know, the, the line has been crossed. We talked about how like it's sort of a little bit blurry, like the threat yeah. <laughs> where yes. it becomes, you know, clearly threat. Um, so th- this paragraph starts off with Arnold speaking. Connie, don't fool around with me. I mean. I mean, don't fool around, he said, shaking his head. He laughed incredulously. He placed his sunglasses on top of his head, carefully, as if he was indeed wearing a wig, and brought the stems down behind his ears. Connie stared at him, another wave of dizziness and fear rising in her, so that for a moment, he wasn't even in focus, but was just a blur, standing there against his gold car. And she had the idea that he had driven up the driveway all right, but had come from nowhere before that and belonged nowhere and that everything about him, and even about the music that was so familiar to her, was only half real. Um, So like even that paragraph, like there's references to, you know, where has he come from? Like, where is he going? Where has he been? Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah, that's, that's amazing you found that Joe passage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah seeing, that's, yeah. that's a, that kind of hit, that hit the walk coming to and fro, hither and yon really, really kind of struck me. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that's a that's a great passage there. Um, uh, you know, it, it also points out the the music. Music is such an important part of this. You really get yeah. that sense of like this is a part of what is invigorates her and uh, and all of her friends. Like this, it's really is that place and time yeah. when popular music that's really just kind of intended for the kids is, yeah. is, is kind of separating itself out of, I guess, popular music that everyone, especially the parents, would listen to. Um, sure. so, I mean, yeah. especially at that point in time, too, where there was, I think, probably for the first time, this popular culture, especially music, but like the first time this generational rift yeah, was really like ripped open wide in terms of like, you know, the dangers of rock and roll compared to yes. you know, the generation before it. But I'm also, it's just occurring to me now, like, you know, where I've, you know, I'm born and raised in New England. So there's always, you know, all the folklore tales and, uh, you know, young Goodman Brown stories of like, you know, sort yeah. of a devil figure. Yes. You know, they're corrupting or they're trying to convince someone else you know, to do something. It's usually like in the woods or, you know, the creepy New England woods. <laughs> Whereas, you know, here's a story that's set in, I don't know, middle America, Americana, where it's, yeah. you know, he first introduced at a car hop sort of. Yeah, you know, and he sounds, just sounds like you know, Indiana, probably. Right, Indiana, drives, Ohio. Yeah, right. Just drives up, you know, the driveway. You know, there's yeah. certainly no, uh, the, you know, this old tale of of you know of of the devil or, or a devil coming to sort of, you know, convince you <laughs> to yeah. your own doom. You know, just as you know, presented in such a, a I don't know, mesmerizing different way. Uh, Do you think that it's important that? that the story either is or is not that Arnold friend is or is not a supernatural threat versus just a yeah so sociopath grooming like lecherous old man pedophile right. whatever is that an important distinction or 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 is it important that we don't know which one it is um to the appeal of the story is that is the mystery important or is it is it is that irrelevant and it's really just about what the girl's experience is yeah, I definitely don't think it's irrelevant. I don't know how I, I, how I would sort of articulate that. But, uh, but you know, for instance, like I haven't seen Smooth Talk, the movie that, uh, that would, or the movie that adapted the short story. Oh, I didn't uh, know there was one. Yeah, Treat Williams and Laura Dern. Oh, wow. And, uh, I could be totally incorrect, but I get the sense that that is played more straight or where there's no, yeah. no supernatural element potentially. Interesting. And I, I haven't had as much interest in watching that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think part of that just goes to sort of, you know, the idea of, you know, I like how Joyce plays with, you know, even if she goes into like deep, deep cut, you know, Bible references. Yeah. You know, most of which would go over my head. But I don't know. There's the, you know, the idea of youth and innocence and even sort of one of the oldest stories of obviously the Garden of Eden. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, it's placed in this modern context. Uh yeah, you know, I don't think any readers, you know, in the 20th or 21st century would have a hard time imagining, you know, an older man, you know, trying to, you know, essentially, you know, he's going to kidnap this 15 year old girl. Yeah. And, and yep. you know, good things are not going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, so I don't know if like the the hint of the supernatural makes the story more palatable. I mean, you know, because it's obviously awful, you know, the threat of, of what's going to happen to Connie. And typically, like, I don't enjoy reading stories about, you know, that. Yeah about sexual violence so obviously yeah. this is all the threat of future future sexual yeah. violence but it's just how i don't know how this story is presented um i, I want to say there's something more to than obviously the awful fate that awaits connie i think it's the story of their interaction to me which is really the truly horrific part of it yeah. and the idea that she doesn't know exactly what's going on i think mm -hmm. you know I, don't know, I think we can relate to that. The idea of threat, like how we don't know until it's too late kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't does, know. It does seem like, and in, in, in my little recap, I, I use these words uh, intentionally, but it does seem like she is being drawn in at the end into a situation where as a, a young girl, she, she's going, she's going to grow up. She's going to grow up into a society in which, you know, boys, teenage boys and men are there looking for looking for conquest essentially sexual conquest over over girls and and over women um and that she really doesn't just like she's being she's been mesmerized by this guy arnold friend whether it's supernatural means or not 
it's, it's almost like she doesn't have any choice by the end. Like she's being right. dragged in, not against her will, not against her will. It's like she, it's like, it's almost, there's kind of a sense that this is, this is what it is to grow up. And so in that, in that way, you might take it as just kind of like a, a very spooky metaphor for what it's like to, to grow up in America in this time, especially where um, sex, sexual relationships and male female relationships are becoming a little bit less, less regulated by society, by church, by, by media, because you are having radio stations playing music that's a lot more, um, you know, appeals much more to, to uh, teenage sentiments and things like that. So yeah, but it just seems like she's being kind of yeah, like here's here's your initiation into adulthood. Um, you're going to be sucked <laughs> into it like a like into a vortex. I mean, it's it's it is a, it is a creepy creepy end to a story, even yeah. if you think it's purely naturalistic. No, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's no separating the gender of, of what's happening in the story too. I mean, because you know, I think part of what makes it so you know disturbing and creepy is that you know if you read it as nothing supernatural happening, just how easy it is for, you know, yeah. for a 15 year old girl in this case to be in danger. This, yeah. you know, guy just rolls up her driveway where her parents happens to not be home. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and that seems like that's a lot less um, likely to happen today because we've had, you all, well, like the eighties and nineties with all the stuff coming out about serial killers. Um, uh, you know, it seems less likely kids are more, their parents are more aware. Like my kids didn't really play out on their bicycles out in our, in our neighborhood very much at all because just, and I did all the, you know, I would ride my bike from my house to downtown and back and stuff. I mean, we're in a different age, I think, because people are, are aware there are predators out there. Um, and if you wrote this story today, I mean, that's, I, it, it does seem like adding, adding in a supernatural element would be a little bit maybe unnecessary or strange because we, we all know what the story is. Oh, this is the predator mm -hmm. who we know is out there and there's no supernatural element needed. We, you know, the, the devil is well and alive and he's living in our, in our neighborhoods kind of feel to it. Uh, and he's just a person. He's just a really bad person. So yeah, strange, strange scenarios. Um, well, thank you. That's, that's a, it's such a cool story. I'm so glad yeah. that, uh, that uh, you chose that one. And let's move on to the next story, which is called The Dirty Kid by um, Argentinian writer uh, Mariana Enriquez. Enriquez um, was published in English in, uh, for the first time in 2017 in her collection, Things We Lost in the Fire. I'm going to give a little recap to this and then uh, sure. ask you why you chose the story. Okay. The Dirty Kid is the observations of an unnamed woman of an affluent family. She lives by herself in a well-appointed ancestral home in what is now a blighted Buenos Aires neighborhood. Street Savvy has so far kept her from any serious harm. As she notes, it's a question of not being afraid, of making a few key friends, of greeting the neighbors, even though they're criminals, especially if they're criminals. On the corner in front of her house uh, lives a homeless young woman, addicted and pregnant, along with her five-year-old, a dirty, sickly, street-hardened boy who deals in prayer cards, applying the hard sell to subway passengers. The narrator's friend, Lala, is who she describes as the, quote, best transvestite hairdresser in the neighborhood, gossips that this homeless woman will do anything for money and even attends witches' covens. Um, the narrator is skeptical, but Lala reminds her that though she is a resident now, she really is from another world. Late one night, there's a knock on her door. It's the dirty kid. He says his mom left and hasn't come back. He's hungry and he won't admit it, but he's scared. She invites him in, gives him dinner. She has no dessert to offer. She'll take him to an ice cream shop that's open late, and she knows which streets are least likely to be dangerous this time of night. The kid walks barefoot on sidewalks strewn with broken glass, past altars of the cowboy saint uh, Gachito Gill, an army deserter who was tortured by police and decapitated, 19th century figure. The boy is uncomfortable around the altars. He speaks of other altars on the far side of the train station, altars to San La Muerte, Saint Death, and skeletons that litter the shrine. When she returns home with the boy, his mother is back on the street corner and accosts the narrator with a broken bottle, screaming that she better not touch her son. The narrator flees. The next morning, the boy and his mother and their mattresses and everything of theirs on the street corner 
is gone. A week later, a young boy's corpse is found in a parking lot nearby. News reports and rumor indicate the unidentified boy was decapitated as well as tortured in ways that have the hallmarks of an occult offering to San La Muerte. The narrator grows sick with certainty. The victim is the boy from her street corner and racked with guilt for not doing more for him that one night he was in her care. When photos of the victim are finally published, she sees it's not the dirty kid at all, and the grieving mother on the news is not the homeless pregnant woman. Still, there is no sign of the boy from her corner. Shortly after, the narrator is returning home from work. When she sees the homeless woman, her belly now flat, she attacks the woman, demanding to know where the boy is. The homeless woman screams that she doesn't have any children and flees. A block away, she turns laughing and cries out, I gave him to them. She strokes her empty belly and calls out, I also gave this one to them. I promised them both. The homeless woman runs disappearing into the city. So Paul, uh, <laughs> why did you choose the dirty kid? What, what impact does this story have on you? Yeah, you know, so obviously, you know, this was published a lot, <laughs> many years after Joyce Carol Oates' story. So I don't know, for me, this was a similar like, wow, you know, moment reading, um, you know, those are the sort of the moments that I look for, yeah. um, you know, and this is, <clears throat> this collection in particular, Things We Lost in the Fire is something I, you know, whenever I'm asked, hey, recommend something, yes. you know, this is the first, you know, for going on four, four and a half years now, this is the book that I recommend. Um, I don't know, this, this book, uh, this story just really affected me. It just felt so disturbing and dangerous in mm -hmm. a way that's sort of hard to describe. To the point where, like, I remember, you know, I first read it, um, even though nothing happens, like, on screen or on page within the sort of the catacombs behind, like, where the old train used to be, yes. where there's rumors, you know, I, in my head, like, I imagine there was a scene back there. <laughs> and when I went back and read the story, like, a little bit later, I was going, no. That was oh, all, wow. Like, so yeah, you kind of, you kind of inserted head. that. Yeah. Your memory kind right. of, cre your imagination created yeah. that. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really powerful. No, for sure. And, you know, so you know, every time I go back to reread the story, I think I find something, you know, different or, or more interesting. Like, and I think in some ways, the approach of the story is a little bit similar to, to, to Oates's uh, with where you're going, where you've been, you know, insofar as, you know, there's a hint of supernatural, but maybe it could all be real. Um, you know, so playing with ambiguity a little bit, but um, I do think there's sort of the zero and one sort of aspect a little bit too, like even in how the narrator how she uses the narrator to tell the story for much of the story the narrator uses it's very like simple declaratives yes. while there's this mystery happening around but then like later on she'll admit like oh, she's not a good person or you know she was wrong and it's just i don't know the whole thing is just so unsettling and under you know at every opportunity i feel like she cuts the reader's legs out from under them but not in a way that's disorienting or cheap um i don't know it's you at the very end like you just left with this i don't know this sense of loss like you know mm -hmm. here's this place you know this uh, urban blight where mm -hmm. horrible things are happening and will continue to keep happening um i don't know <laughs> it's yeah. you know it's, it, to me it's just a really powerful you know creepy story yeah th there doesn't seem to really be a solution the neighborhood's going downhill right. it has been going downhill for decades now <laughs> um and it's just kind of a matter of surviving the drug dealers the the you know yeah the the mob people the police um you know there's some there's some hints some pretty strong hints that they're you know they're crooked as you know it's right. no surprise no surprise here um certainly but yeah um, you know uh, enriquez uh, is a journalist trained as a journalist and I, right. I think yeah that observatory power i think comes in here to to help make the story so much of what it is how how much do you think um the sense of place and the description, which is very different from where I grew up in, in mm -hmm. America, middle-class America, how much of that you think creates that sense of kind of otherworldliness or danger for you? Yeah, I mean, so for, for me, it wasn't even not so much that it happened to be, you know, in Argentina. Uh, obviously, I've never been to Argentina, well, maybe not obviously, but <laughs> I've never been to Argentina. But in terms of the story, I mean, I think what she does in the first paragraph where she you know, besides the first line, my family thinks I'm crazy, which is a yeah. great way to introduce uh, any first person narrator. <laughs> um, you know, she's talking about this beautiful old house and it's almost like she's, you know, telling, uh, you know, talking about a Gothic, you know, it's a, you know, she plays with like some Gothic tropes here, clearly. 
you know, this beautiful house with its, you know, imposing stone, it's an mm, imposing yes. stone building, iron doors, you know, it's a little bit run down, old mosaics, the floor is worn out, tall windows, walled patio to it, like a secret garden. Um, but, you know, here's this house stuck in the middle of this, you know, blighted urban area. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's clearly an unusual spot to be and that the narrator knowingly is living there, even though she says, you know, sort of self-consciously that, you know, it's not safe to live here, but yeah. you know, so you're still not hundred percent sure why, you know, you know, besides maybe like she mentions a connection to like, uh, but not even that, like she says, I never really miss my grandfather who, you know, yeah. while they ever smiled and never played with me. Yeah. You know, so it's almost like she's, she was really hurt when she finds out her grandfather's sold or they've lost the house out of the right. family. And then she's like, finally got a chance to come and kind of re repossess it for on behalf of the family. But yeah, right. she didn't really, didn't really care about the grandfather, but this house was a place of like great mystery to her, I guess. Right. And it's not like she has like a lot of local connections or a lot of friends, yeah. you know, beyond Lala, um, so, like, I, I think, you know, the narrator is as much a mystery as what happens with, uh, you know, the rest of the story. If you don't yes. mind me jumping right to a please. paragraph that oh, I wanted please, to yeah. read. Because, um, again, like, for most of it, as you mentioned, you know, there is that sort of journalistic reporting. And then, like, I think Mariana just hits you with these observational details and even confessions from the narrator that are really yes. powerful to me. Uh, so this is after she has taken um, at the little boy or the dirty kid to, uh, yeah. to get an ice cream. He's got no shoes on. Yes. Um, you know, they sort of having like a weird interaction. Um, and this is, you know, even after he mentions that there are skeletons back there <laughs> um, and shrines to saints that are less friendly than Gaucho Kill. And, and you had mentioned shrines to San La Muerte, yes. skeleton of death. And like, uh, you know, I like the hint of these old gods that are yes. sort of on the periphery of the story. So anyway, um, so like she asks him, oh, does your mother ever bring you back there? I, I, this is like behind the train tracks with these, or I should say is it underground train. I, I'm assuming some sort it's of like subway. It's translated yeah. as a subway. Yeah. A subway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, cause there are all these shrines to other saints. Some saints could be mad. Some saints, maybe not so bad. Who knows? Yeah. Um, he says, you know, sometimes I go alone. And then he tugged at my arm to urge me onward toward the ice cream shop. Um, so actually they haven't got ice cream yet. Sorry. It was really hot. The sidewalk in front of the shop was sticky from so many ice cream cones dripping onto it. I thought about the dirty kid's bare feet. Now with all his, all this new grime, he went running in and his old man's voice asked for a large ice cream with two scoops, chocolate and uh, dulce de leche. Hope I'm saying that right. With uh, chocolate chips. I didn't order anything. The heat took away my appetite. And I was worried about what I should do with the boy. If his mother didn't turn up, bring him to the police station, to a hospital, let him stay at my house until she came back. Did this city even have anything like social services? There was a number to call in winter to report someone living on the street who was suffering too much from the cold, but that was pretty much all I knew. I realized while the dirty kid was licking his sticky fingers, how little I cared about people, mm. how natural these desperate lives seemed to me, um, which I thought was like a stunning sort of revelation and you know, where she's trying to do a good ish deed by taking this kid to get an ice cream while his mother's missing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, that maybe speaks to why is she living, you know, in this grand house sort of in the middle of all this poverty, not that, you know, even though the house is run down. So I don't know, uh, like all of it, like the motivations of her, you know, the kid himself, you know, the mother who's missing, like all, there are all these like weird, strange mysteries to the story. Yeah. There's definitely a same, I mean, the, the, um, confessions, as you put it, that you get in the story, um, uh, I guess make the make the character trustworthy in a way, but she she just goes ahead and admits she do, she just finds she doesn't care as much as I guess her conscience tells her she should. Why didn't she put? Why didn't she get a cheap pair of shoes for the kid? She thinks mm -hmm. about that while he's walking as he's getting ready to walk down sidewalk. She knows have broken glass on it because people right. fight there. Um, and yeah, why couldn't she have at least given him a bath and cleaned him up? There's, you know, when he shows up that night at her house, um, he, it's clear he's been crying because there are clean tracks that have been run up over his dirty face with right. tears. Um, and there's and and at the end, I think she really after she uh, chases down the um, the uh, formerly pregnant homeless woman who lived on her corner, um, she goes back and there's just sense the sense of I guess maybe failure or defeat or, or probably regret that you know, like she hasn't done more. 
And maybe, mm -hmm. maybe she does kind of belong in this blighted neighborhood because she herself, you know, she, she seems like a good person, but she, she it recognizes her own moral failure to do what just like what common decency would say to do, like, like keep call the call social services, give the kid a bath. At least she gave him some food and took him for dessert out on the street late at night mm -hmm. after hours, which was questionable. But, uh, uh, you know, part of the reason I think she's there is she wants to know that she's strong enough to be able to live in the, a bad part of town and smart enough to do it in a way that she doesn't get hurt. Yeah, it's just very, it's such a, her motivation is very strange there, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, this might be going too far afield, but, you know, knowing that, you know, Mariana was a, a journalist, it don't, you know, maybe you could read this as like, oh, this is, you know, the character, the narrator is almost acting as a journalist collecting a story. Yes. You know, and is there some guilt that, you know, she's not affecting the outcomes of, of sort of, you know, what is sort of, although she does sort of insert herself somewhat into what's going on. Yeah. Uh, she certainly doesn't make any sort of emotional connection. Like even after the ice cream, you know, she's confronted by the mother. The mother is described as being rabid. Yes. yes. Uh, ran at her snarling, you know, and the kid doesn't really, you know, speak to the narrator's defense. Like, Hey, you know, she was just getting me an ice cream. You know, he was just staring at the ground as if it was nothing was happening. And, and the narrator says, I was furious with him. Ungrateful little brat. I thought, yes. And I took off running. Yes. And she struck clearly struggles with her feelings of, I, yeah. I was mad at him because he didn't like defend me against her, his crazy mom. But she, um, yeah. That's an interesting point there though, as a journalist, like your job there is um, one, to put things in third person, right? Because you're reporting on a story, and two, to remain a neutral observer. I mean, that's at least part mm -hmm. of the 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 goal, right? The objective of, of being a journalist. Um, and she does kind of stay, uh, um, in terms of her actions, mostly objective. And then when she realizes, oh my gosh, um, like I don't know where the kid is. Oh my gosh, a kid has been killed in my neighborhood. Now the you see that regret and that anxiety, and that apprehension, that guilt start to set into her at that point. Um, but yeah, she does kind of remain mostly neutral. So it's a really good point. Could she have told the story in second or third person? Would that have, would that have made the story so different? It wouldn't have been as good, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't know in what way it would be different, but no, it had to be first person. I mean, I think yeah. part of the mystery is the character itself. And if you're doing it, if she did it in third person, I think that's a little bit of a cheat because you're with, now as the writer, you're withholding perhaps uh, some objective information about the character from, yeah. from the reader, unless it's like a really cl uh, close third person. But, yeah. I, but I think the voice of the narrator too really informs and is so important to the story. Yeah, yeah. How, how would you, you know, get across so like those even, confessions? The confessions are, sure. are really core to this piece yeah. uh, and not being able to, I don't know how you would show that. Right. And, I, you know, and again, the sort of like the declarative sentences, the, the dirty kid becomes the decapitated boy. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. That's how, sort of how he's named on TV, even though it ends up you know, obviously we think not the same child. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, so we, you know, Lala, I think was an interesting character, sort of like the moral voice. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or, or the, the humanities voice in the story. Yes. Um, and she's, you know, pretty, especially she's pretty flighty. You know, she's a, she's a hairdresser. She was a, a, a I sure. think it was described as a Uruguayan man or Paraguayan man. One of the other uh, decides to become a woman and then, uh, and, and takes up hairdressing and was a prostitute at one point, stopped doing that to become a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. She's very emotional, very emotional. And yet she's, uh, she's also kind of the voice of reason in some ways. In particular, hey, whoever the narrator, we were never told the right. narrator's name, but hey, don't go and talk to the police. You don't want to get involved in something and then have some, nar some like narcotics dealer or right. some occult character show up and, and want to harm you. So yeah, she does kind of provide that voice of reason, even though she's a, a, a kind of a flighty character. No, and I, you know, sort of humane emotions as well. Like the emo yes. I think, you know, strong emotions, strong reactions that, you know, I think, you know, I was certainly having when I was reading yeah. the story, you know? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. I wonder if there's a, maybe a little bit of, um, I don't know, I think about uh, like Lovecraft's story, the, uh, um, the, the Red Hook one, the, the terror at Red Hook or what, whatever the name of the, the Red Hook one, which is, you know, notorious. Which for I haven't read, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty ugly, in particular, it has a, it's a really, it's a good, creepy occult story. And it's got some of his more um, infamous racist descriptions of the unwashed masses, you know, the immigrants right. coming over. That's, that's one of the stories he's, 
he's been most uh, strongly critiqued for. Um, but you do get a sense that like there's like you may be walking through these neighborhoods with these great tenement halls full of all of these people who you live in the neighborhood with them, but you're not part. You're not part of their culture. You don't know who they are really. Um, and there are things going on in the background, like the, basically stuff that we hear all these rumors about, oh, this child was decapitated and his head was set next to his body because the head is supposed to have power. And it's a way of the whoever's doing this to try to get power of protection against their enemies. And it's all like rumor mill type stuff. It's like, the, it's kind of treated like all the crazy things that people in this crazy neighborhood are gonna say. But the further you get into it, the more you start to think, oh, maybe there really is something going on back behind the, uh, the old train station. Right. Maybe like these things are taken, all of this kind of, uh, yeah, kind of syncretized Catholic and, maybe old world, um, uh, uh, ancient religions, maybe, maybe there really are people taking them seriously and making these kind of offerings to St. Death and things like that. Right. Now, obviously, you know, the mom at the end of the story shouts, you know, at her gleefully that she gave the kids to him, but that, that really only comes after, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in lesser hands, this would be tough to do, but like, you know, there's this big confrontation with the narrator and the and the dirty kid's mom, who's yes. no longer pregnant, um, you know, and she's strangling, you know, this, yeah. you know, strangling the mom. And she's, you know, she says, maybe as everyone had said, I was fixated on that house. She's talking about her own house mm -hmm. because it allowed me to isolate myself because no one visited me there because I was depressed and I made up romantic stories about a neighborhood that was really just shit, shit, shit. Um, so again, a confession, her being honest, yeah. but at the same time, those aren't her own words, own words. She said, you yeah, know, that was what my mother shouted at me yes. when yes. I, and I swore to never speak to her again. Yes. Um, so I think by the end of the story, like, even though, you know, this, ur ur this blighted urban area is clearly haunted. I think, you know, the narrator is haunted and her, her house is haunted. Like the last paragraph is about how, you know, she's afraid the lights are going to go out. She's not safe in her own home. Yes. It's yes. not because of, of, of crime. It's just because of, I don't know what she knows and what she's experienced, et cetera. Yes, yes. Do you, so, um, yeah, this is a fairly recent story, of course, published in 2017. Do you think that, uh, and, and, you know, we, I think we've, we're seeing a real influx of horror translated into English coming from Latin America in particular, well, in the film world as well. We mm -hmm. were seeing quite a bit of that as well. Um, some terrific um, horror films are coming out of Latin America. Um, do you think that this story is... is um, uh, do you think it's it's like doing something new in the horror genre and maybe that's one reason it pops so vibrantly or is it because maybe it's, it's just coming from a culture that's that's not a north american culture and so it's so different it pops vibrantly do you, do you think that the story is um yeah is it is it really like doing something new or is it is it just a, a fresh perspective that we're getting i mean i think the perspective uh is definitely you know a part of it for sure but um, I don't know. I think I feel like every story that I if that makes a mark on me that I really enjoy is doing something new. Yeah. Um, you know, just even sort of the, the basic idea of we talked about, you know, sticking this sort of you know gothic castle in the middle of a yeah. you know of, of this blighted urban neighborhood is really interesting. Yes. Um, yes. And, and done in a realistic way. Like I would assume that you know maybe this is the kind of you know I, I think we've all been in cities where you can see houses or you know giant brownstones that probably at a certain point in the city's history where, you know, whereas where affluent people live, but is now in a neighborhood that isn't so affluent. Um, There's a, a really cool passage um, uh, in the story where she talks about, um, uh, let me read, find this quote real quick. Um, she's talking about the, the neighborhood and, and the many people who live here now. She says, this is pretty early on in the story. I like the neighborhood. No one understands why, but it makes me feel precise, daring, sharp, there aren't many places like Constitucion left in the city, which except for the slums on the outskirts has grown far richer and friendlier. It's intense and enormous still, but easy to live in. Constitucion isn't easy or friendly, but it's beautiful with all its old buildings that stand now like abandoned temples occupied by infidels who don't know that praises to the gods were once heard within those walls. What a lovely little section there of, uh, of narration. I, I really like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, mean, I even think there's a hint of, you know, I wouldn't say like 
gentrification necessarily, but the mm -hmm. idea of, I don't know what, what a term would be for someone who, you know, has money and decides to go like live in a sort of a poor neighborhood. I mean, yeah. I think there's a little bit of, I don't know if it's exploitation or, or, or adventurism or, I don't know. I, <laughs> adventurism well, might be it, of, yeah. Yeah, but sort of like, you know, on the backs of, you know, other people, right? You yeah. know, like, yeah. you're yeah. here, you know, oh, like you're, the by the very fact that you're choosing to live in this poor neighborhood, like somehow giving you some sort of measure of self-worth. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is in itself is very sort of uh, problematic slash complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and would, know, and would fit so in with on. her confessions. Of, I mean, right. she recognizes her moral, moral failings. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. No, well, and absolutely over her head, too. But then, you know, yes. so you have that. And then you have, I don't know, just this amazing situation of, you know, as readers, we instantly want to have and do have compassion for this, you know, homeless child. Yeah. And like sort of how it plays out is just so unexpected. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Without. I, I never felt like I hated the narrator. I just, I was always interested in what she was going to do. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, obviously I think I, I would like to think I would make better choices, but maybe I yeah. wouldn't. I, I think that's sort of the, the very interesting, you know, the cool aspect of the narrator as well. I, and this is just how I read it. I don't even get the sense that she hates herself or that she feels like she's a complete moral failure and a bad person, but there is a sense of moral malaise. It's, not even so much self-disappointment, but just like, mm. this is the world. Wow. Right. This is pretty awful. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's corrupt. It's yeah. you know, down to the core. You know, even this, the kid himself, you know, I think she sort of views him as already corrupted, Yeah, you know, in a certain way. You know, and, and with yeah, all yeah. that sort of like, I don't know, deeper reading stuff, it's just a creepy fucking story. It, it is. Absolutely. That, uh, no, the ending is yeah. just like, wow, that's a good, like, that's the kind of sharp ending you expect in a movie. Like the last thing you see is she turns around and she's given this crazy smile, laughing and smiling. You know, I gave them both to them. I, I gave them to them kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the kids, the kid you mentioned, like he's already kind of corrupted. Yeah. She describes him as coughing. He's five years old and he's smoking in the subway with the other kids. He's always seems to have a cold and his voice is gr gr gravelly and rough. Uh, I, I know a friend of mine who adopted three um, uh, children, three girls from uh, a couple who were not ready or prepared to have children. Um, and these, one of the girls had been from birth given orange juice to drink, not milk, not formula, orange juice. And so I, I grew up knowing this little girl or, uh, you know, or she grew up, she grew up uh, at our church and I knew this little girl as, as a little girl and her voice sounded like this because the orange juice had destroyed her vocal cords mm, and you got to kind of get this, uh, it's just terrible. Um, and so these are the three luckiest girls in the world because they'd been adopted by a woman who yeah. was a good woman who would, who cared for them their entire life, you know, all through their childhood. But I get the sense that's what's happened to this, the dirty kid. He hasn't, he, well, he's smoking and he probably ha hasn't had anything like proper nutrition. And, and he sounds like an old man now. It's just such a, like almost an Akira anime film kind of thing, you know, it's just this bizarre image of this dirty little kid with an old man's voice. Right. And it sort of flips, uh, <laughs> flips it with Arnold, our old friend, right. Who yeah. is sort of trying to pretend to, you know, yes. he's older trying to pretend to be younger. Yeah. Um, and he I could be some, I, I he be some like, ancient being who knows. Right. Yeah. You know, and the idea that the narrator, like she was sort of like, do I bring the kid in the house? And I never thought like she would. Like, I think her spending so much time on the dirty feet or on his feet being dirty. Yes. Um, you know, after opening about this, you know, beautiful old, somewhat run down, but beautiful sort of gem old house. Like yes. You can't let that kid with the dirty feet into the house. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think yeah. there's, there's part of that, you know, in there too, just subtly. There's one really tiny little subtle point here where he walks into her front door, but then he comes to the door of the dining room and stops like he has to be invited mm, in. That's right. Yeah. I, do you, any is that just a cultural thing or does that does that mean something to you yeah, i don't know sure. what that means yeah, yeah. it's it, it's probably some yeah I, I would assume it's some kind of local culture thing or maybe maybe he's just used to not being allowed into places yeah that i think eat. i kind of read like yeah little kid right he's not right yeah he doesn't just like she he doesn't know what to do with her as much as she doesn't know what to do with him yes yes either way fascinating story what an incredible writer i'm going to run out and get that that book things we lost in the fire do you want to mention one or two other stories that you just really like from that collection 
Oh boy. Um, I'm so terrible with the, <laughs> like, so the, the story with the ties, but the story after at the end is this, you know, wonderful uh, haunted house story. The, t- the title story is, you know, more sort of like socio-political mm-hmm. allegory in some ways, you know, very yeah. angry, uh, you know, pro-feminist story that uh, that's really well rendered. Man, I'm going to forget <laughs> an invocation of the big eared runt. You know, huh. Most of it takes place on a bus with a strange sort of bus rider. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, I think it is it the neighbor's courtyard or under the black water. There's a very love, overtly Lovecraftian story. Oh, wow. In this collection as well. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, full, full on Lovecraft. Uh, okay. But okay. One of the things I really enjoyed about this collection is that the, the range of types of stories where. Yeah. And then having read a bunch of interviews that Mariana has done, like it's clear that she's read like Jackson and, and she reads people who publish now, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the U S as well. Like yes. she, I mean, she, um, yeah, she's, you know, is super well read in, in the genre, both in what has come before and what was happening now. And really mm-hmm. looking forward to, I think in about a year, we're going to have her first uh, English translated novel, like an 800 page epic. Oh, wow. Yeah, that that just came out in Argentina, I believe, this summer. But I, okay, but I, I did hear that. Um, yeah, I know it's coming out next year. I don't, I'm not quite sure when. Cool, very good. Something definitely to look forward to. Well, this has been a great chat. Thank you very much, Paul, for, sure. for taking time to talk with me. Um, tell me a, a, about what you're working on right now. Oh, well, actually, let me ask this first. Um, uh, in terms of other, you know, we mostly talk about short stories on this program, but uh-huh. you know, it's it's all about fiction in any of its forms. Uh, what other what other forms of media horror do you uh, you know regularly take in? Movies, comics, anything else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly movies. Um, I, I used to, yeah, comics occasionally. I've been in sort of a comics rut. I haven't read any comics in a while, so that I cannot uh, necessarily recommend. Um, but for movies, you know, Saint Maud is one of my favorites of the past year. Oh, it's it's dynamite, yeah. Yeah, the relic. I yeah, relic. Weirdly, good. yeah. So talking about horror and other sort of forms, uh, this weekend I sort of discovered uh, a group called Clippings, which does uh, rap, hip hop. Yeah, they did two records, um, sort of inspired by and riffing on horror movies. Um, so like I've been listening to some of those over the weekend and I just ordered the two CDs from some Interesting. Pop. So I'm looking forward to, to, to diving into those a little bit more. Yeah. Deeply. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one of my favorite classic rock albums uh, was Alan Parsons projects, I think is their first album. It's uh, tales of mystery and imagination. It's, it's a bunch of Edgar Allan Poe stories turned into songs. Uh, the Raven being probably the, mm-hmm. the one that would have been like gotten in the airplay, but they've got, uh, several songs and uh, 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 about his stories, uh, Cask of Montalado, uh, Professor Tar and Doctor Doctor Tar and Professor Feather, uh, and a number of others. So yeah, that's 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 also been oh, cool. fun, uh, done yeah. by them as well. Um, and I did want to ask you um, from our listener mailbag, we got a question <laughs> from uh, on Reddit from Blue Blue Kudu Blue Kudu. Okay. Who who asks? Have any of your stories ever given you a truly visceral reaction as you first began developing it? Um. Hmm. Uh, maybe cabin at the end of the world. Once I knew a certain event was going to happen. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. Uh. Yeah. But you know, usually, like I'm so close to like the the gears of the story that like it doesn't really affect me that way yeah until maybe yeah. like maybe later after like time passes like i don't know for disappearance of devil's rock one the, you know in the editing phase the ending changed a little bit and then when i was reading it uh reading it for the copy edits i don't know i was sort of like emotionally moved by the last chapter which is kind of weird wow um i don't know i, <laughs> I don't is want to sound it? too self-indulgent but like yeah. normally it doesn't bother me uh yes actually the the the, the closest well and it wasn't really my story. Like I happen to be writing a short story and I, I know we're on a podcast, but I can see echoes behind you. Yes. Uh, yes. Ellen, Ellen Datlow's a ghost story anthology echoes. Yeah. I have a story, I have a story in there. Uh, and I was writing the end and the end that I was writing, it, the character was essentially me. There was a noise upstairs in his house that he goes to investigate. And that sort of becomes the ending of the story. And as yeah. I was writing it broad daylight, there was a noise upstairs, like something oh. really loud. Oh yeah. So I can't say the story scared me. It was the noise. Like, but yes. it happened at the same time I was writing. 
man, like oh, that- all the cliches of like hair standing up, <laughs> totally freaked out. Middle of the day, it was just me and my 15 pound dog who wasn't going to be much help. Wow. I, I had to summon what little courage I had. I grabbed the baseball bat and walked upstairs <laughs> and it was, you know, a bottle of shampoo had fallen off a shelf in the, in yeah. the, yeah. You know, in the bathroom, I, windows must have been open. I'm not quite sure why it was falling, but yeah. Wow. So oh, that that's... happening scared me more than my story. That totally, <laughs> totally counts. Okay, Blue Kudu also says, there are, there are, another question for you here. There are many Christian faiths that are stranger and have more intense practices than Catholicism. Why, in your opinion, does Catholicism provide so much material for horror? I don't have any more context for that. Of course, I immediately go to the film, The Exorcist, uh, and the novel, The Exorcist, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly no expert, even though I I sort of grew up, not sort of, you know, Catholic until about the age of seven before my family stopped Mm -hmm. going to church. And I've been in and around Catholic institutions for most of my, educational institutions for most of my life. Um, Yeah, maybe part of it is sort of the, I don't know, in New England, there are so many, there's a lot of Catholics in New England. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's probably the predominant, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know. To the point where, like, wherever I grew up, like, I didn't really know what Protestants were yeah. until yeah. an embarrassingly old a- older age. Um, yeah, so it becomes sort of, I don't know, so like the New England stereotypical Catholic thing, I don't know. Or maybe I think it was, wasn't it only the Catholic Church for a while was sort of famously had exorcists in their employ. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think there's part to, you know, to the ritual of the Catholic mass compared to a lot of, you know, I know he referenced there are some sort of stranger offshoots of, uh, yeah, well, of like snake of Christianity. Handling, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of Protestant based snake handling. Yeah. Stuff. But, you yeah. know, within the and Catholic church, mentioned. the mass itself, there's all sorts of symbolism and, you mm. know, the, the turning of the blood and the body of Christ, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sort of rife for, <laughs> yeah. Right for fictional treatments. Oh, yeah. Um, man, there I'm gonna, a, a richness. I can't yeah. remember the name of the book i'm so awful but michael cisco his one of his first novels that was republished recently was it maybe it was the knife dance i think it was called the knife dance i'm 95 percent sure Mm -hmm. but within it he has like all these like splinter christian groups (laughs) and i think they're all real but like hundreds of years old like what he ended up using with them but like so strange like the different sort of beliefs and you know he, he weaves it into this weird dark uh you know horror slash weird story yeah you yes. know that i think our our, our if our uh, reddit questioner is interested in that kind of stuff you might it's certainly worth chasing down michael cisco's the knife dance yes i think that's part of the um i'm just looking on the internet uh speculative fiction database which is just about my favorite site um there's the uh the san Venefizio canon series right. and the knife dance uh from 2016 is part of that yeah. yeah. And, you know, his first novel was called The Divinity Student, obviously. But uh, yeah. the, the knife dance, like, explicitly references these strange ancient Christian sects uh, within the story. Yes. That, yeah. You know, for a reason. It, yeah, it's pretty cool. That's really neat. Um, all, and and um, um, speaking of comic books, and I, you know, I, I think that fiction as it is, just a printed word on the page, is magnificent. I don't know. Um, I, I really just can't think of any examples where any adaptation to any other medium worked has a better is a better experience it's a different experience but right. i can't think of one where it's a better experience than just reading the straight up fiction but i do love um adaptations into fiction i even have one of my kind of let me see where is it over here one of my um prouder elements of my collection would be uh, the nightmare, oh, yeah. the nightmare factory from That's Thomas Ligotti stuff. I've got volumes one and two, and like you got some top artists in this. I think uh, you know Colleen Duran does the um, Last Feast of the Harlequin, and like it's it's really it's got some really really cool stuff in it. But um, if if any you were going to get any of your stories, your short stories, or I guess mm. novels or whatever adapted to comic books. Which one would you want? Which do you think would be most fitting for comic book form? Any thoughts? Oh. Um, I would love, <laughs> can I choose the comic book person too? I would love Jeff oh. Lemire's Swim yeah. Wants to Know If It's As Bad As Swim Thinks. Really? Because I, I think, you know, because what Jeff does with like sort of uh, like family dynamics and drama, I think are yes. amazing. But he also does like weird, horrific stuff too. 
Yeah. So yeah. I, I think he would be perfect for that. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, that's great. That's yeah. awesome. We'll just put that out there into the universe. <laughs> okay, cool. That a great answer. Um, speaking of other media, I do want to just mention really quickly. Um, like I, uh, uh, I, I don't have a physical copy of your books because I listen to them all on audible, you know, oh, nice. yeah. and, and um, I have to recommend um, a head full of ghosts on audible.com. It's narrated by joy as Osmansky. And it is just as creepy as it is. It's also completely delightful. She is such a great narrator. She does amazing. Yeah. Fun fact, Joy plays a supporting role in the Iron River, Michigan episode of Monsterland, which is based on the collection oh. North American Lake Monsters by our good friend, Nathan Ballingrude. So, I did not know that. Little connection oh. there. I didn't realize it was her. It's like, I saw her and I thought, wow, she's great in this, in this episode with um, uh, Kelly, Kelly Tran. And, uh, and then I looked up her information and I was like, hey, wait a second. She, or I recognized her name from having yeah. been a reader there. That was awesome. And then your short story collection, Growing Things, has some terrific narrators and there's just like nothing quite as pleasant and absolutely creepy as Sean Crisden reading something about birds, especially mm. his William Wheatley voice. It's a very, you know, very, very, very gentle Southern man. Uh. It's, a, it's kind of a, <laughs> almost a, a William Faulkner kind of sound yeah. to it. And it is absolutely chilling. Um, so there's some great stuff there. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sure pretty, most of your stuff, I think, has been adapted to audio. But go, yeah. go and buy a copy of the book, read it, and then listen to it as well. Sure. Yeah. All, Either all, or any of the ways. <laughs> yes. And then maybe comic book adaptation someday. Jeff Lemire will, will yeah. be talking to you. Um, <laughs> when things get dark, this comes out. This will be out about um, a couple of days, probably, before this episode is posted. But Paul's okay. you've got a great story in here called The Party. Well, thanks. And uh, it's, it is it, I think it both manages to have a, that, in, in that kind of interpersonal dynamic that is where there's very, you gradually get a picture of the conflict going on between people, but also has your kind of classic ambiguous ending like, okay, what's, what's really happening? Like uh -huh. that person looked at that person and what does that mean exactly? And, I, I feel pretty sure I know where this is going, but it has a good creepy, like, oh my gosh. Oh no. Like what's next going to happen? Cause it doesn't look good kind of ending to it. But uh, well, thank you. It, it also reminded me a, a lot of the film, the invitation, which is an excellent film. Logan green Marshall, I think is um, the star mm. of that one. Um, yeah. There's some, definitely some, uh, some resonance there. But yeah, uh, when things get dark, that's a that's a really terrific collection. Yeah, I'm looking. I have. A, I'm looking forward to reading the whole collection. So yeah. yeah. Do excited. you have Do you have any um, uh, any movie adaptation news that you can share with us? So you, you nothing. Had a couple I can't, things that were awesome, yeah, right? I yeah, I can't tell anything. Spe so anything specifically beyond you know, Cabinet at the End of the World is under option. Head Full of Ghosts is under option. Actually, and Survivor Song is under option as well. Oh wow. Um, all I'll say is I'm hope I'm hopeful that there could be some like really cool news for both cabin and, and ghost uh, coming either between now and the end of, or between now and January or in January, you know, yeah. Knock, yeah. On, knock on all the woods. Uh, you know, there's, there's movement afoot for both. Awesome. So. January is right <laughs> around the corner. That's great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I also, I saw that uh, Stephen Graham Jones was in LA. Uh, he just posted he was in LA on Twitter. So I, I suspect maybe there's some meetings going on over in, in his, in his neck of the woods as well. Right. So my, you know, I would love to see those adaptations because I, I love horror films, but um, also I think just the visibility it can bring sure. to yeah. writers who are just who we just love within the horror or fiction community and, and need to be known in the broader community. So I'm excited about that. Thanks. Um, anything else coming up in terms of like just short stories getting published uh, coming up, uh, uh, next novel, et cetera, anything else you wanted to mention? Um, so my next novel, uh, I, I'm getting copy edits like in a couple of weeks, is called The Paul Bearers Club. So that'll be out in the US and probably the UK at the same time, uh, July 5th. 2022 okay um yeah no it's an odd book i'm i'm really excited for it uh <laughs> awesome people have fun with it uh it's sort of presented as a faux memoir or a memoir of this character named art barbara mm -hmm. although you know he this whoever's writing this memoir names himself art barbara that's not his real yes name. gotcha um and so basically he's telling his life story starting from like junior year in high school where he was a 
you know, a self-identifying high school loser. Yes. Um, and, he, and he started what's called the Paul's, the Paul Bearers Club as a way to get an extracurricular activity where he volunteered at a local fu- funeral home to serve, um, you know, people who didn't have a lot of living relatives, maybe, you know, yeah. homeless or elderly people. Um, you know, and it's not very successful until a, a strange, maybe college age woman, he's not quite sure, and joins yeah. the club. And this woman becomes like a, a figure throughout the, the following decades, sort of almost like a frenemy. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes. Who may or may not be so, a supernatural sort of uh, entity of some sort. And it, she it, sort of, it, she comments in between the chapters. And even as the book gets deeper and deeper, she makes notes in the margins and stuff like that. So oh, I think that'll wow. be really fun to read. Yeah. Oh, that does sound cool. Is there such a thing as a Paul Bearers Club? Are there, is that really a service? That, uh, yeah. That you find uh, I, I, I got I've the idea from a, a kid at my school. Uh, oh either gosh. did one or was trying like he made an announcement about it and it was like november of 2019 and wow you know he at my small school we do like yes monday morning announcements in front of the whole school and he said hey i'm doing this thing called the ball bearers club and i was like what yes <laughs> yeah like, oh that's amazing i gotta use that okay well i, <laughs> so I, I, I did I yeah. expect we'll find his name in the acknowledgements then at, at least oh, that's <laughs> i probably should huh <laughs> <laughs> you, might, uh, you know you might consider or it might open you up to a lawsuit who knows yeah so right. well um uh, everyone, this, this is how fancy my show is. I'm holding up a card for you, the user who were just listening, but uh, follow Paul on at Paul G. Tremblay uh, on Twitter, where he's quite active. And uh, um, I think you have paultremblay.net as well, which is your website. Yeah, it's so my website where if you go, I have a free newsletter and I, I don't spam your inbox very frequently. It's usually like yep. once a month. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking time with us. Had a great time talking with you about these stories, and we look forward to um, reading more stories from you in the very near future. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.